At long last, you have come, stranger from another time. Welcome to Giza, and to the age you know as the old kingdom of Egypt. I am no ordinary jackal, but Anubis, a powerful god among the Egyptians. I have summoned you, O stranger. Three of our kings cry out for your help. They are starved for nourishment to sustain their life force, their ka, forever to eternity. Find them and bring them the offerings their cause need. Ah, long and difficult is the path that awaits you, I fear. But I, Anubis, will guide you. Call on me whenever you wish and I will help you.
You have come to Saqqara, stranger. Here you will see the first of all pyramids ascending on mighty steps to the heavens. In the beginning, stranger, there were no beginnings. No up or down, no day or night, no time, no space but only a vast ocean of gloomy waters, immense, motionless, and inert. Yet in the depths of that dark flood lay a god, and we have many names for him. Atum, Re, Horus in the horizon, Lord to the limits of the sky. He is the sun who creates himself. When he appears, he is like a lotus flower, fragrant with the entire world, an egg containing everything. Look! He parts the black waters, sustained upon a mound shaped like a pyramid. He rises slowly and majestically like a great heron in first flight. From the golden splendor of his eye comes to be everything that exists. Atum sneezes, and there is air. Atum spits, and there is moisture. The beads of his sweat are the gods, his tears are mankind. Earth and sky are the children of air and moisture. We call them Geb and Nut, and their union produces many gods. Osiris, Lord of the Dead, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys. Atum speaks, and his word becomes the world. You can see this creation every year when the earth rises from the floodwaters of the Nile. You can see it every dawn when the sacred beetle pushes the sun high into light land to sail across the liquid sky. You can see it in every human life when the spirit leaves the inert body to live again with the sun. Atum's beginning is the beginning of beginnings. He is eternal sameness eternal recurrence. Stranger, intelligence lifts many good things into the light. Look upon the prize you have earned, a scarab. This beetle represents the god Kepri, who came into being by his own power and raises the sun in the east each day. The amulet symbolizes renewed life and protects its owner. This is the first offering to the king's life force, his Ka. Praise to you, Horus, Sky Falcon, whose flight reaches the horizon and surpasses the gods of the sky. Your eyes are the sun and the moon. Son of Isis and Osiris, God of many identities, helpless babe and mighty avenger, hail. Stranger, we look upon all our kings as the living embodiments of the great God Horus, who preserves the world from chaos. For Horus's life shows the perils of kingship. As an infant, Horus, the rightful heir to the throne, was killed by his uncle Seth, who took the shape of a scorpion and stung his nephew, so that Seth might continue to hold royal power. Yet even after Horus returned from the kingdom of the dead, Seth refused to relinquish the kingship. Then strife and fear were born on earth. For many were the battles Seth and Horus fought. 
Seth took the shape of a savage crocodile. He twisted himself into a poisonous snake. He ballooned into a ferocious pig. Yet in all of these battles, Horace beat Seth back. One day, Seth found Horace sleeping beneath a tree and plucked out one of his eyes. Seth then hurled the eye beyond the world's edge. Thoth, the ibis-headed god of wisdom, observed Seth's evil deed and hastened to retrieve the eye. When he found it, the eye was all in pieces. Thoth collected the pieces and, chanting over them, restored them once again. This eye is the full moon, and we call it Widget, the eye of wholeness. It is the power to heal, to illuminate, and to act. At last, in a fury, Seth swelled up into a hippopotamus red as flame and planting his four stout legs in the Nile, opened wide his mighty jaws to swallow his enemy. Strong-armed Horus cast his harpoon and struck the raging beast. The gods then hailed Horus as the true pharaoh. And the entire land exulted because Osiris's son had now become the king in his father's place. Horus holds dominion in the Black Land, the Nile Valley where the soil is fertile and the people may live and flourish. Yet Seth is not annihilated for order cannot exist without chaos. Seth rules in the Red Land, the desert where none may dwell. He journeys too with the sun in the daily voyage across the heavens, and his voice is the thunder in the sky. Stranger, behold the trophy of your courage and strength. It is the widget eye of Horus, his broken eye that was magically made whole by the god Thoth. It is our amulet for healing. Bring it as the third offering to nourish the Pharaoh's Ka. Hail to you, Osiris, Lord of Eternity, King of Gods. The eldest born of Geb and Newt, you rule both the living and those beyond. Osiris is one of our mightiest gods, stranger, the god of the underworld, but the god, too, of resurrection and continued life. Osiris was once the king of Egypt. Isis, his sister, was his wife and queen. Our land flourished under his reign. He governed the waters of noon and brought favoring breezes to the land so that the earth teemed with food and plenty. The sky and all the stars obeyed him. Yet Osiris's peaceful reign was shattered by an act of violence we find it difficult to speak about. For Osiris's brother Seth attacked him while he rested beneath a tree by the river Nile and there murdered him. Seth cut his brother's body into several pieces and strewed them far and wide so that Osiris might never again be found. But Seth could not destroy the love and cunning of Isis, Osiris's consort. For Isis roamed the land distraught with grief for her husband and intent on finding each of his parts. When she had found them and reassembled them, Isis gave breath to Osiris so that he might give her his love one last time. The child born of their miraculous union was Horus. 
Osiris entered the hidden portals of eternity, where he now receives the dead in the underworld. His own death and resurrection speak of the life that continues even after death. Hail to you, Osiris, whom thousands bless and all mankind extols. After Seth had murdered Osiris, Isis spirited their child Horus far away to a hidden swamp and raised him there in secret to protect him from Seth's jealousy. Yet Seth took the shape of the scorpion and stung Horus while still a nursling in his mother's arms. Isis tried to rouse her baby with magic, but to no avail. Thoth, the god of wisdom, assured her that Horus had merely gone to visit Osiris in the underworld, and that he would one day rise again to avenge his father. Stranger, behold the reward for your cunning and perseverance, the second offering to the king's life force. It is a statue of Isis and her son Horus, for whose sake she endured so much. It will remind you of the renewal of life after death. It is the second offering to nourish the Pharaoh's Ka. Death is no extinction, stranger, but only a new beginning. To the dead king we cry, Oh ho, raise yourself, O king. Throw off the earth from your flesh. The power of the king's divine presence, what we call his Ba, mounts like a bird to the skies. And there rejoins his life force, his Ka. The doors of the sky are open to him. He sails in the sun's celestial boat. His ascent is like the primal emergence of the sun from the eternal waters. Our pyramids embody this ascent. They are a colossal staircase on which the king climbs to the stars. Only a genius could have imagined and built such a mountain in stone. This genius was Imhotep, who served King Djoser, the first great ruler of the Old Kingdom. Imhotep was many things, a magician and astronomer, a scribe, physician and vizier. But above all, he was the architect who planned and built the first of the Great Pyramids, the mighty Step Pyramid for his king at Saqqara. Imhotep began with a mastaba, a low building with sloping sides that had served as tomb for earlier kings. He placed a second mastaba on the first, and another, and another. As the pyramid grew, so too did Imhotep's conception. Once four steps had been built, he asked, why not six? And so the pyramid rose up until it towered over Saqqara with its six mighty stairs. Imhotep had it built completely in stone to endure forever. And when it was finished, the stone gleamed white and brilliant in the sun. He surrounded it with stately courts and buildings splendid to look upon. This small city in stone was a model of Djoser's royal palace so that he might continue to live like a king in the afterlife. Imhotep embellished it with columns carved like the papyrus or the lotus and filled it with mighty statues of Djoser, blue-glazed tiles, and exquisite vases of alabaster, quartz, crystal, and serpentine. 
No one before Imhotep had ever built a monument completely in stone, and none has ever surpassed him in the grandeur of his conception. Once Imhotep had achieved it, others could admire his vision and build yet other pyramids for later kings. Imhotep's creation of the pyramid is like Atum's first emergence into light, the first appearance of what had never before been seen. We worship him as a god for his accomplishments. To create excellence, as Imhotep did, that is eternity. Look, stranger, power and foresight have accomplished a great work. See the arms lifted up. They represent the Ka, or the life force. See, too, the Ankh, the hieroglyph whose meaning is life. This dish means the one whose spirit lives. Bring it as the fourth offering for the Pharaoh's Ka. In this land, stranger, the king is a god, for he judges men and destroys evil, and his word creates truth. He knows the manifestations of Ray and defends the world from chaos. Yet gods may be children, too. Once, a six-year-old boy named Neferkare became Pharaoh. We call him Pepe, the second of that name. May he live, prosper, and be healthy. Now, boys do not always worry about judgment and evil and preserving the cosmos. When Pepe was eight, one of his chamberlains and chief explorers, Harkuf, voyaged to the distant land of the Horizon Dwellers, where he found a pygmy who performed the dances sacred to the gods. Upon hearing the news, Pepe wrote and ordered Harkuf to bring his wonderful prize north at once. Be careful he doesn't fall into the Nile, the young king anxiously commanded. A point trustworthy people to attend him when he sleeps. Check him ten times at night, for my majesty longs to see this pygmy more than the riches of Sinai and Punt. Pepe grew to be a man and married several times, a cousin, a niece, and even his half-sister. In this way, our kings mirror the god Osiris, whose queen was also his sister, Isis. Pepe ruled Egypt for 94 years, the longest reign of all time. But at the end of his rule, when Pepe was old and weak, so too was his land. The pyramids Pepe built at Saqqara for himself and his wives were the last of the old kingdom. For after his death, insurgent nobles rose up and took power each for himself. Pepe's dynasty soon collapsed, and the mighty accomplishments of the pharaohs withered away. Anarchy now ruled, and famine and destruction. Woe to us all when we have no king to be a god in our midst to establish order and preserve right. Hail the Pharaoh Neferkare, Pepe the second of that name, flourishes again. His Ka thrives and is strong. He thanks you for the offerings your cunning and resourcefulness have won. Let no good service go without its reward. The Pharaoh has gifts he wishes to bestow on you in return. Receive.
receive now your gifts from the Pharaoh. I, Anubis the Jackal, greet you, visitor from a distant time. I have seen and marveled at your foresight and intelligence. You have nourished the Ka of the mighty Pharaoh Pepi and gladdened his heart. The chaos that descended on Egypt after Pepi's death has been beaten back, and order and right now rule again in this land. You have come to the time you know as the Middle Kingdom. You are now in Daryl Bari, on the western bank of the Nile, across from the royal city of Thebes. It is good that you have come, for now a second king calls upon you to nourish his life force, his ka, with offerings. You see before you his temple. If you help, you will earn a great pharaoh's blessing. I, Anubis, will assist and guide you. Whenever you need me, call upon me. Hear a story of wonder, friend, a most marvelous and instructive tale. One day the great King Sneferu, may he live, prosper, and be healthy, roamed his palace in search of entertainment and found nothing in those splendid halls to divert him. Bring to me the scribe priest the writer of books and worker of wonders, Jaja M. Ankh, at once, His Majesty commanded. And they brought the scribe straight away. Jaja M. Ankh, the king said, is there nothing in this palace to divert me? I have searched these splendid halls for entertainment and found nothing. Then Jaja M. Ankh, who was very wise, replied, Ah, but certainly, Your Majesty, you should go to the royal lake. Bring twenty oars of ebony covered in gold. Let the handles be of sandalwood and plated with electrum. Then summon twenty comely maidens to row you up and down the lake. The sight of these beauties plying their oars shall refresh your majesty's heart. King Snefru gave orders that all be done as his scribe had suggested. Soon the twenty maidens were rowing the boat, and King Snefru's heart was gladdened and refreshed to sail on the glancing waters. But now one of the maidens, unused to such exertions, began to comb her tresses. And as she did, her turquoise pendant, shaped like a fish, fell into the waters. I shall get you another just as good, King Snefru promised. But the young woman shook her head and simply said, I want my own. Then the king commanded, Bring me Jaja M. Ankh at once. And they brought him straight away. Then Jaja M. Ankh worked his magic. He spoke and piled one side of the water upon the other so that the lake rose up into a great sparkling wall. There, on the lake's muddy bottom, lay the bright turquoise pendant. Jaja M. Ankh brought it back to its owner and then, with a word, ordered the looming waters to resume their place. At once, the lake lay calm and flat. All rejoiced at the wonder, and the king, who had indeed found the refreshment he craved, rewarded Jaja M. Ankh with all good things. My tale has come to its end, just 
as it was written. Words spoken by Count Megat Ray, the Chancellor and Great Steward, the truly beloved of his Lord Kings. In my life, I looked upon great and turbulent events. As royal seal bearer, I saw the good Montu Hotep reunite the two lands, and so restore Ma'at right in order to our land. I saw my fellow official Amenemhat rise to become the Pharaoh, the living God, after the passing of Montu Hotep, and I served him too as his chancellor. And now, you who pass this way, behold these goods provided for my grave. Wooden servants to render me in death all good things of this life. See, stopped in mid-step, they keep count of my cattle. They fatten them forever. They slaughter them for meat. They grind wheat for my imperishable bread and ferment my beer for millions of ages. The women weave an eternal cloth. The carpenter's arm is forever at work. My Ka shall sail through light land in the sun's bark. Ah, oh, but I remember the plash of river waters slapping my boat. The captain's loud commands and the sailors' grunts as they ply the oars. I see again the glimmer of fish pulled from the sparkling waters and feel anew the fresh breezes bellying the sails. I remember wine and fine linen and the scent of the lotus blossom in my hand. Once more I hear the harpist's music and the blind man's songs. Surely no existence can lack such delights. And so my servants attend me, repeating life and sweetening the West, the silent kingdom where I go. They have come in procession with offerings to my tomb. Their baskets carry a thousand of bread, a thousand of beer, a thousand of meat and fowl. They come to nourish my Ka and help me traverse the terrible perils of the underworld. Ah, oh, me. I go alone to meet a vast eternity with only these wooden figures for escort. You who hear me, follow your heart while you live. Increase your happiness. Do not be cast down, but anoint yourself. Follow your heart and happiness. A procession is made for you, O Meket Ray, on the day of your death. Look, friend, a priest comes to prepare the spirit for its long journey to another world. These bearers follow him, bringing gifts and offerings, all that the Ka needs for continued life in the afterworld. Behold their gifts. Your task is to make offerings like these for the king's life force, his Ka. See your offerings join the procession to the pharaoh's Ka. You have accomplished your tasks well. Go now and seek the Pharaoh. What joy to speak of disasters after they are past. A mighty storm once smashed a ship at sea 
and one sailor only managed to escape. Clutching a plank, the poor wretch drifted for days on the great green sea, until the surf washed him up on a strange island. He was not hungry, for the island had the most wonderful profusion of vegetables, fruit, and fish. On the third day, the sailor heard a sound like thunder. But never was there thunder like this. The trees shook, the earth trembled, and when the sailor dared to look, a bearded snake fifty feet long and covered in gold and lapis lazuli towered over him. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you, my little one? The snake hissed. If you don't say at once, I shall burn you to ash. The sailor went rigid with terror and could not speak. The huge serpent lifted him gently in his jaws and carried him to his dwelling, where he laid him safely down. Flat on his belly before his mysterious host, the shaken sailor found his voice and told him the story of his shipwreck. Fear not, fear not, fear not, little one, the snake murmured. You sh shall see your home, your wife, your children. A boat soon came, as the snake foretold, and the snake gave the sailor the choicest treasures from his island. Myrrh, incense, giraffe tails, long-tailed monkeys, baboons, elephant tusks, and all good things. The sailor brought the snake's gifts to the king of Egypt. The king, dazzled by the gifts and the sailor's story, thanked him, and made him the commander of two hundred men. Never despair then, my friend, for even snakes may be our saviors. Friend, for us it is unthinkable to die in any land but Egypt. The wanderer may travel far and wide, but in his old age, he yearns for burial in his native land. Such is the story of Sinue, a loyal servant to the king Amenemhat. Assassins set upon the king while he slept and murdered him. At the time, Sinue chanced to be with the royal army in the far western lands. A great terror possessed him when he heard the news of the king's death, for he feared the chaos that might ensue. He fled at once, and roamed the earth to Byblos and Kedem in the north, stopping at last in the land of retinue. There, Sinue met Amunenshi, the ruler of that land, who promised him great wealth. He set Sinue over his children and married him to his eldest daughter. He bestowed on him a wonderful land called Yah, where the soil burst with figs and grapes, and wine was even more plentiful than water. Sinue became great and powerful. He gave drink to the thirsty, and he restored the wanderer to his path. Yet Sinue's thoughts turned to Egypt. For now, he was becoming old, his senses dull and his limbs weak. Nothing could be more important than to join his body to the land of his birth. When Senwasret, who was now the pharaoh, heard of Sinue's yearning, 
he summoned him at once. Come home to Egypt, he wrote. You shall not die abroad. Too long have you roamed across the earth. Here you shall have a funeral procession. Your coffin will be encased in gold. Its head will be of lapis lazuli. Come and receive your funeral rites. Upon returning to the king's court, Sinue knelt down and kissed the earth. To meet the king face to face was like dying, for Sinue was in the presence of a god. He lay prostrate and could not speak before the divine pharaoh. Yet Sinwasret was gracious to him. He gave Sinue a great house and a splendid garden. He stocked his tomb with all that was needed. Sinue lived in the king's favor. And when he died and the day of landing came for Sinue, the king bestowed on his body funeral rites such as no commoner had ever received. The beginning of this story has now come to its end, as it was written. Friend, we regard the king as a shepherd to his people. He must tend them well, for they are Ray's own flock, for whose sake he rises in the heavens. For them, Ray appoints the king, while still an egg in his mother's womb, to be a mountain and a refuge for the millions. The king is a mighty warrior and merciless to his foes. For him, to speak is to act. Perception stands behind him. Utterance is in his mouth. His attack is sudden and his triumph is swift. One of our great warrior kings is Neb Hepet Re, whom we call Montuhotep. May he live prosper and be healthy. He was a prince of Thebes in the south. He overwhelmed the north and reunited the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt, which had split apart soon after Pepi's reign. Then began a new era of glory for Egypt, which you know as the Middle Kingdom. Beneath the towering cliffs of limestone outside Thebes, Montuhotep built a pillared temple. There he placed a tomb for himself and his wives. Along the cliffs and in the valleys, nobles who served Montuhotep and later pharaohs as well, placed their tombs beside the beloved warrior king. Sixty soldiers too lie near Montuhotep slain in some battle lost to memory, and now laid to rest alongside their axes and daggers, their bows and arrows tipped with flint and ebony. Montuhotep excelled by pleasing the gods, and so we praise him. Golden Horus and Ray's own son the dual king of Upper and Lower Egypt, lord of the two lands, Neb Hepet Re, Mantu Hotep, given life forever to eternity. Hail, the Pharaoh, Neb Hepet Re, Mantu Hotep, once again resumes his strength. His nourished Ka now thrives. He thanks you for the offerings, and decrees that your skill and generosity shall have their reward. Receive now your gifts from the Pharaoh.
here you are again, my friend, ready to embark on the third and last part of our adventure. You have come to the time you know as the New Kingdom. Foreign invaders from the East have been expelled at long last. Pharaohs once again rule the two lands and protect Egypt from chaos. Yet the Ka of one of our pharaohs is troubled and hungers for nourishment. If only you can help this third pharaoh, then great joy shall be yours. For you will join me in the Hall of Judgment, and then shall you journey in the celestial boat of Ray, the sun god. Behold, before you once again there rise the cliffs west of Thebes. But now there is a second temple, broad as the horizon, built by the king who calls upon you. Once there lived a brave young prince. When he was born, a goddess prophesied that he would one day meet his fate from a snake, a dog, or a crocodile. The king, his father, sought to protect him, but the prince soon became restless with his sheltered life. Why do I sit alone, he said. Let destiny do what it will. I must act according to my heart's wish. And so the prince went and got something he had long desired, a fine greyhound, and set off together with his dog into the distant lands to the east. In his travels, he came to the kingdom of Mitanni, where he married a good and beautiful princess. When he told his wife of his three fates, she cried, Have your dog killed at once! But the prince refused to harm the companion of his travels. Nonetheless, the prince's three fates pressed upon him. For that same day, a crocodile spied the young prince and would have eaten him. But a demon prevented the crocodile from leaving the waters. Later that evening, while the prince slept, a snake slithered toward him, murmuring, I am your fate. But the princess set out bowls of wine and beer so that the serpent became drunk and harmless. Then she had the snake cut in pieces. The next morning, as the prince lay in bed, the greyhound suddenly barked at him, I am your fate, and gave chase. Seeking to escape the snapping dog, the prince leapt into the water, where the crocodile was waiting for him. The crocodile said to the prince, I am your fate. You cannot escape. But if you help me overwhelm the demon that torments me, I will release you. Here, friend, the story as it is written breaks off. Which of the three destinies do you think befell our prince? The young prince agreed and defeated the crocodile's demon after a long struggle. Meanwhile, the white princess went out with amulets to charm the dog. Under the amulet spell, the dog ran off into the desert, never more to threaten the prince. When the prince swam to the surface, he found his wife beckoning to him from the riverbank. The prince blessed his wife and praised her for her goodness. Creatures of destiny, find trustworthy friends. Do kindness to others so that you may receive it in due season. The young prince agreed and overwhelmed the crocodile's demon. The demon finally said, Release me, and I shall do as you ask. The prince told the demon of his faithless dog. Oh, fool, the demon cried, to make a pet of destiny. Young sire, you cannot befriend fate. The demon then snatched the dog from the riverbank 
and spirited him far away to the desert wastes. The prince prospered and lived a long and happy life with his wife and children. The brave prince agreed and defeated the crocodile's demon. The crocodile left the waters at long last and with one bite of his powerful jaws sliced the prince's dog in half. The prince and princess lived happily then and in after years the adventurous prince taught his children befriend your destiny and make an ally of fate and then you shall flourish. See the prize your skill has earned, an ivory hound. Oh, fear not, friend. Not all dogs turn on their masters. It is a companion fit for a king. Friend, our land teems with the restless vigor of youth, and yet it harbors within itself the inconceivably ancient. When our great king, the fourth Thutmose, may he live, prosper, and be healthy, was yet a prince, his strength was bounteous and his beauty shone forth as though he were Horus himself. A mighty hunter, he stalked his prey with bow and arrow while thundering along the plains in his chariot drawn by horses swifter than the winds. One day, seeking rest after a hunt, Thutmose approached the shadow of three mighty pyramids from the distant past. The pyramids of the ancient kings Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaure whose golden peaks looked down upon the drifts of sand swirling in the brilliant noonday sun. Half buried in those sands lay a colossal figure in rock, a lion with powerful talons and the serene and awesome face of a god. Its countenance crowned with the sacred cobra gazed from ages past into the pathless future. In the noon's heat, dreaming came upon Thutmose. Shielding his eyes against the fiery sun, he seemed to see the mighty face warm and soften into life. I am Harmachis, Horus in the horizon, he said. I am your father and the father of all pharaohs. One day you shall be king and rule over the two lands. You shall wear the red crown and the white. The land shall be yours in its length and breadth, all that the sun looks upon. But you see how time has nearly buried me in sand. When you are king... Remember me and treat me as a son treats his father. Thutmose was astonished, not least because though a prince, he was not the eldest born. Yet soon thereafter, Thutmose became Pharaoh. Mindful of his fateful meeting with Hermachus, Thutmose cleared away the sand from the Colossus and exposed it once again for a million generations to admire. Behold, even now the Sphinx looks upon you, friend, with the same ageless gaze that Moses saw so long ago. Once again it seems to speak. Look upon me and remember me. Here, friend, is the reward your devotion and skill have earned. 
This blue faience sphinx represents a mighty king with the power of a lion. Be a scribe. A man perishes, his corpse is dust. Even the mightiest graves crumble and are forgotten. But a book is better than a mansion or a monument. Even the gods have their scribe, the ibis-headed Thoth, the god of knowledge and wisdom who records men's deeds in the Hall of Judgment. Is there any like Ptahhotep, the learned scribe whose instructions are wise and whose name is everlasting? A pen was his son, a book his legacy. Copy his maxims, young scribe, and engrave them in your heart. Befriend the papyrus scroll, for it is sweeter than wine. Its words are like pyramids in the heart of those who read them. Let these sacred glyphs and their message live in your heart. Do not be arrogant. Wisdom dwells even among the ignorant who toil at grindstones. Do not boast, the gods respect a silent man. Lend your ear to the man in distress. A good hearing will ease his heart. Beware of greed, it has no cure. Be generous to your friends, kindness to others is an enduring monument. Follow your heart. Your life force, your ka, demands this. Provide for your household, and then follow your heart. These are the instructions of Patahotep, handed down from generation to generation. We train our apprentice scribes by setting these instructions for them to copy. Young scribes must first prepare their brushes, and the palettes which hold cakes of black and red ink. They must memorize over 700 sacred hieroglyphs and learn how to draw them beautifully to please the eye forever. The scribes can write their lines from left to right or right to left. Scribes write down the stories we most love, the spells that protect the dead, the wisdom of our ancestors, the deeds of our warriors. They are, young scribe, the voice with which we speak to you. Behold, O oh friend, the prize your diligence and skill have won. This is the great god Thoth, who invented the science of numbers and first studied the stars. He gave us the hieroglyphs and guides and protects the scribes. Amenhotep the Magnificent, the giver of laws and the smiter of Asiatics, speaks. Behold my wife, T. Her father and her mother were not of royal birth, but her husband is a mighty king whose empire stretches from Nubia to Mitanni. Although Our Lady T was of common birth, when has a king ever loved his queen as Amenhotep loved her? Amenhotep was a lavish builder, and he commanded that his queen be shown in glory beside him on his monuments. He joined her name to his as a part of his royal title, so that royal works issued in the joint name of Amenhotep and T. But his greatest love gift to T 
was a pleasure lake he built for her near their palace. The lake was nearly a mile long, yet Amenhotep had it completed in a mere 15 days. He named it The Sun God Shines, and beside its cool waters he planted gardens of flowers and aromatic herbs. Amenhotep declared a festival to celebrate its opening. He and his queen rode on a great barge up and down the lake's waters, while tumblers turned somersaults and dancing girls with castanets plied their steps. Musicians mixed the sounds of harp and flute with the mild breezes, while singers chanted, I sail with you, my love. Sweet as pomegranate wine is this stream dug by my hands, and delightful to wander hand in hand. My queen has come. I stand gazing at my heart's desire. The descendant of Amenhotep and Ti was a lad who ruled for nine years. This boy's name was Tutankhamun. May he live forever to eternity. He was dead at 18 years of age and received a burial that was sumptuous beyond telling. In the desolate wastes outside Thebes lay hidden his house of millions of years splendid with gold, whose like has never been seen. But amidst these treasures to their god-king, his people also placed the game of Senate. Was it to aid Tutankhamun in his passage through the underworld? Or simply because he loved to play the game? I cannot say. For us, Fate and games are closely linked, and we bring our amusements with us when we go to face eternity. Receive this trophy of your youthful vigor. It is a gazelle, the delicate beast who flourishes in the desert land where no person can survive. She represents life that continues even after death. Hearken to the words of Hatshepsut, Lady of the Two Lands, the Good Goddess, and Daughter of Re, Ruler of all Egypt, whose like the Earth has never seen. Her voice issues from her monuments. You who look upon my works, hear me. I have restored ruins and raised up what had been unfinished since the foreign invaders lived in the Delta. I have overthrown the works they built when they ruled the Northland in ignorance of Ray. Never have we known a marvel like Hatshepsut, for she ruled our land for 20 years. Not a consort or queen, but a mighty pharaoh and a woman. King of Upper and Lower Egypt with the royal cobra on her brow. We lack the image for such a wonder, and so we represent her as a male king with a beard and a kilt, and we have come to call her Lord, Good God, and Son of Ray. A widowed queen, she ruled as regent for her nephew Menkepa Ray. But in the seventh year, she took the name and offices of king, co-ruler of the land. Our land flourished during her reign, and many and great were her works for she sent out an expedition of many ships to the land of Punt far to the south along the great green sea and brought back splendid treasures, 
gold and ivory, ebony and myrrh for the gods of our land. She restored the temples that had been long neglected. Beneath the rugged lime cliffs near Thebes, beside the monument of her great predecessor, Montuhotep, she built her funerary temple, broad as the horizon at sun's rising. Hatshepsut's name appears no more after the 22nd year of her co-reign with her nephew. At that time, the king emerged from his apparent obscurity and became a great warrior. You know him as Thutmose, the third to bear that name, the creator of a mighty empire. Some say he hated Hatshepsut. We know that he effaced her name and smashed her images. But Thutmose waited over 20 years to do these things. Hatred does not usually wait so long to lash out. The king's reasons, I fear, are lost forever. Hail, the Ka of Mahat Kare, Hotship suit, the mighty Pharaoh, waxes and grows strong. The Pharaoh has seen your works and has decreed that they shall be honored. Receive now your gifts from the Pharaoh. Welcome, friend. You have come to the Hall of Judgment. It is I, the mighty god Anubis, who greet you. Many are the adventures we have shared, and I have seen your gracious offerings. You have gladdened the cause of the three pharaohs, of Pepi, the second of that name, in the Old Kingdom, of Montuotep, the warrior king of the Middle Kingdom, and of Hatshepsut, the female king of the New Kingdom. They look with joy upon you, for thanks to you, their names will live forever to eternity. Place now your heart scarab in the scales, so that your heart may be weighed against the feather of truth. Brave voyager from another age, generous, resourceful, and wise, the scales have proven your heart, whose goodness and purity raise it high up, lighter than light. Come, friend and enter into the joy of life forever unto eternity. Behold Ray, who rises perfect each day, more lustrous than gold, creator uncreated. He rises in his celestial bark to journey a million miles across the heavens in a day. He beckons you to join him, Voyager in the splendid eminence of the skies, and there to live forever to eternity.